No. I would stream a video off the board and I just. Well, I mean, I can see like the. Oh, you mean of the projector? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, I can see streaming a video of the whiteboard. That would make sense, right? That's good. My little crossbar there. Leave it in my office. All right, I gotta go to my office real quick. I could shoot the screen, but it won't load it either. You're toast, Fernando. You're not getting any credit for today's class. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Very nice. I'll let you know. Dr. Lur is pissed. Christian's pissed. <laughs> Bro, get out of there. Christian is now your podium, dude. Get you better out. be you better be clocked out right Christian's now. Pissed. Dude. You better be clocked out, dude. I have that I didn't even clock in. Yeah, yeah. Is Danny there? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you don't know. He's right next to you. All right. All right. No. I was just re. All right. I'm out of here. No. What? Okay. I was telling him that he's, he's toast. His break's over. He's <laughs> <laughs> done the first place. <laughs> didn't come to class because you didn't have really class. Yeah. I'm slighted. My class is what's important to you. That's why I'm going to go. Well, you can't. I know, I, I did put that alarm in that day. Yeah. Can you go and hit the um the projector button so it'll show up on that other screen? All right, I think it's only fair that we test mine first, right? Um I'm reasonably confident this is not gonna support the way I want it to support. Wait, where is it? Is it it's should be like the 70 projector button? Oh yeah, yeah. Projector one, projector two. Uh projector one. Okay. I mean, I'm pressing. I pressed this button twice. Hasn't done anything. Oh, it's muted. That's the problem. I probably hit it twice. I would not have guessed it with mute. Really yeah, that always messes with me too. Video mute. I've never heard it called that. Wait, how come it's like? Okay, no, it is going. It's just way. Okay, I was wrong. I thought I was centered on the correct side of the of the table, and I was not. Hi, Krishana. All right, can you see that pretty good, Fernando? Yeah, now we're solid. Now it's, now it's looking good. Now we're making sense, right? All right, let's turn this on. We're gonna keep this on the at the same time, we'll try. So this is, it says zero pounds. I don't even got in like 10 or anything. So, on my problem that I noticed almost right away when I got this off is that when you push down on this, one of the sides of the arms almost always collapses, or rather buckles first, right? So, in this simulation, when you apply one to the top, it applies it ideally. So there's no variation into like distribution. And so it doesn't like calculate buckling, right? It's like a perfect 
perfectly symmetrical load, which there's no way of really applying that perfectly. Like, you took it and put it into like a press, right? That was able to press it down perfectly without allowing for deviation, like that's the right. You know, maybe you have that six pounds. And it's obviously it's not breaking, right? Like, you know, if I could hold it in place, it wouldn't buckle. Yeah. So, but if you apply the load to the bottom, that's what I thought you this one? Yeah, like if you're applying, you can get more, but it's still gonna. I mean, if you like flip this, but you're applying the load here instead. Oh, yeah, we probably get more, but that's what I thought we were doing. Just because, like, I mean, that's not how we loaded in the simulation, though. I guess right? you have to load it in the simulation. That, that, yeah. Yeah. that was what they thought was a real press, but the cars are like this one. Yeah, yes. But that's why in the like a dress bridge, you have those sort of supports going along the length of it, right? It's, it has to support the load all the way down, yeah. right? I mean, we can see how much load this thing would support, like if that was the condition. But I don't think this would be very easy. I should zero this so it has like the actual. Um, but I gotta be more patient. So I'm gonna be like, did you already try that on yours? Did you figure that was gonna happen? No, I had this. Yeah, I just knew it was gonna happen because I pulled out the thing. I'm like, oh man, this is so flexible, right? So pretty much as soon as I loaded it off. Yours is more rigid, yeah. yeah. Yours is also so two times as long. Probably not even deeper for as long friends. Uh, it was like three hours. It's like three, like three. Yeah. What was yours? An hour. Sorry, it was an hour. Yeah. An hour. So two, like a three, let's say four, but not even five pounds, right? All right, great. You're just back in the Say what you can grab the bar, you can put this in the bar how you want to. That's how we originally designed it, but yeah. You want to try and use the bottom instead and do that too. No. So I think that yours is going to have the same issue as mine. Now you have that support on the, on the side, which might help a little bit. Are you centered? I think so. Okay. Two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, maybe twelve, thirteen, sixteen. Pretty good. Not bad. Probably the vicinity. You can see that it failed because the uh, the back support is actually so your bridge part didn't actually break. Oh, okay. But those that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just that little bit of the frame added enough rigidity that it didn't buckle. Yeah. Right? Until it didn't, and then it buckled. Yeah. Right? Okay. So even just a little bit of extra support on this to prevent it from buckling, yeah. like on that, like you know, there, would have made a huge difference. Yeah. And if we had known that, right, at this, <laughs> yeah, when we started designing our bridges, we should have accounted for that and made them just a little bit thicker along one edge yeah. so that they would buckle. You ready, Kishana? <laughs> what the your longest span is it that's going to be in compression? Is that and you don't really care about buckling and tension, right? Just in compression. Yeah. So you know, just look at like my span. Well, that's not the same. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But your walls are also a little bit thicker, which will help prevent that buckling. Let's check make sure our nine inch cell line is just like this. Let's move that end up there.
for the acquisition of this transfer. All right, so we call that, we call it 16. But now when I realize that I don't think I have to make the whole count. Right. <laughs> All right. Is it Saturn? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-two. 23? Oh man, it's been good. Too hard to pull. Oh, the dark box Oh, yeah, it's good. Oh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, so Krishana's had the highest flow limit. Okay. Hers actually didn't fail under buckling because that top number was tension, not in compression, so things pulled down to both sides. Um, but because it was bending, right, you had a, a bending load as well as the tensile load. The bottom, what happens is the bottom portion of that broke first, right? And then as soon as the bottom portion breaks in a little bit, then uh, the rest of it breaks a lot more. And you can actually see, see the bottoms of the white lines. That's where it was uh, plastically stretching out on the bottom that's coming down. If you look along the side there, it's a little hard to see. You see how it's white on the bottom, but not on the top. So it's stretching on the bottom. That bottom layer, right, goes first, and as soon as that first layer goes, it loses its like collapse all the way. Right. Uh, but we were all supposed to hold 50 pounds. No, that's it. So we all go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cristiano was the closest to succeeding. Honestly, if it was a factor of safety, if that was the factor of safety, right? And the design load was like 25 pounds, yeah. she would have succeeded. Yeah. But Cristiano, Cristiano was the closest to 26 pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, almost right away though. Patrick showed up like 16 pounds before and went. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, I just like turned around my face. Oh, it's really cute. I just realized he's like my chest. Zoom out the zoom out the video and we'll talk about the um, the rest of the topics we're gonna cover today. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to zoom this around until we have um, the front screen up on the boards. Am I going the right way? I'm not. It's weird because like I'm going left in the video. Kind of. Is it? Is this mirrored? No, it's not mirrored. It's because I think it should be mirrored. It's probably the problem. All right, now we do want to look at the white on the whiteboards. So, for now, are you seeing the whiteboards? Yep. Good. All right. Uh, today, I want to talk about tolerance analysis, and we're going to look at this a couple of different ways. Um, I guess it's over here. Uh, the first way I want to look at it is just worst case scenario, right? Um, using min and max constraints, which is super simple. You don't need uh, really anything besides a pen and paper to look at the tolerance stack up, right? So if I have a series of blocks, right? I'm just using three because it's easy just to draw three. And I want to know what the total dimensional range right, of those blocks is, I can do what's called the worst case analysis, right? So on this block, if I'm saying we have this is one inch plus or minus 0 0.1 inch, and I'm going to say that that's typical. 
So each of these blocks is one inch plus or minus zero one inches, right? Okay, the video is flipped. Is the video flipped for you, Fernando? Or does it look regular? I think it's flipped. How do I unflip the video? What did you write on the board? Uh, hold on. Can you read it now? Nothing changed. Right. Nothing changed for you? No. I mirrored it in mine. Do I need to like go into the camera settings? Oh, I don't even know. Can you try writing a word like Patrick sucks? Write it backwards. Okay. I mean, I wrote letters there. Is that backwards? No, that's, I mean, no, that's, that's, that's good. good. Okay. So you can that's you read the, the one plus or minus point one? That's what that is at the top. Okay. Does that make it, sense? It's, yeah, it was just a little messy. It's just grainy. Was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can see it on mine. It doesn't look super clear. I don't. I can't increase the resolution though. I don't have it. I can zoom in more. I guess. No, that's okay. I think we're good here. Oh. Too bad. I already did. All right. There we go. All right. That's good. So if we're saying that each of these blocks, right, is one plus or minus one inch, then the sum of those three is going to be three plus or minus 0.3 inches, right? So the first slash easiest way of doing that is just a linear sum of the tolerance ranges. Because what you're saying is anything inside that range is within tolerance, right? So anything across the sum of those ranges is also going to be within tolerance. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, this does not have to be linear, right? I could have a linkage. Right, and there could be some position here, X that I'm concerned about, right? And easily each of these linkages can have some angle, right? And some length. But I can still calculate the position of that linkage position, right? And I can take the minimum and maximum values from that and find some position at this point, right? using just the sum of all the possible variances. When you have a, a multi-dimensional analysis, that becomes a little bit harder because you need to know how the variance of each one is going to change the output. So for instance, if I care about this distance here, right? When this angle gets smaller, that gets bigger, right? So I wanna use the minimum range of angle when I'm calculating the maximum of X, right? And then the maximum range of the angle when I get the minimum of X. Whereas the length, as the length gets bigger, X gets bigger, right? So you need to know how each of these parameters correlates to the output. And usually what you do is usually like a weighting factor where I'd say L1, uh, theta one, L2, theta two, right? And I would say, how does the variance of L1? So if L1 is C, it's plus or minus 0 0.1. And then I'd say, what is the weight? The weight of L1. And then I say we have, say, plus or minus one degree. And then I have some weight of theta one. In this case, the weight of theta one, right, uh, would be, what is it, cosine? Uh, yeah, so cosine of theta. And when it gets larger, right, it's going to change. Does that make sense? So we're going to say that this is like going to be cosine of theta and decreasing theta is actually going to increase that value. So I'd make that negative cosine of theta, right? Does that make sense? Whereas this one, you know, we're looking at that same length, it's still gonna be a fraction of cosine of theta, but it's gonna be positive. So this weight here would be equal to positive cosine theta. Does that make sense to everybody? To some extent, plus or no? All right, so you can, so on this case, if you imagine, if I have this link, right, I'm just gonna make the microphone the link. As I decrease theta, X gets bigger, right? If I increase the length of the link, X gets bigger, right? The amount that it increase, the increasing of length increases the length of X is a function of cosine of theta, but it's positive, right? As I go down, right, that change in length is also gonna be a function of the cosine of theta, because if it's up here, right, 
changing theta L has almost no impact on X because you need a really big change in angle for it to make a change in distance, right? I go the way around actually. Um, but down here, right, a smaller change, a small change is going to change that out. But it's going to be negative because as I go down, I get further to the right. Does that make sense? So you can make a table of all those values and figure out, okay, for each of my linkages, what is the relationship between the change in that value, right, and the change in the thing I'm trying to measure, and then add all those up. So either way, it's kind of the same analysis. It's just a function of how complex is the relationship between your, your linear dimensions and your tolerances to whatever it is you're trying to measure, right? Um, so something like this, you probably don't need an analytical tool to help you do that. Something like this, you probably want to use either Excel or SOLIDWORKS or something to help you run that analysis, right? Um, and so we're gonna look at that a little bit today if we have time uh, in the tall analyst tool. Does that make sense? All right, the next thing I'm gonna show you guys is doing this, but with a little bit more accuracy using a Monte Carlo simulation inside Excel, or not Excel, inside um, MATLAB. So if you go into Apps Anywhere, Uh, I don't think so. We were gonna use it, make everything out of the box. And then I'm going to launch MATLAB. It has been terminated. I'm gonna try and launch MATLAB again. <laughs> Cause that's the way it works. Um, I think to save time, I may try and pull up the example I have in the DFM class, because I have something very similar to this in there. Since I'm waiting for MATLAB to load anyways, I'm just gonna try and get that uh, document. I'm not loading. I'm gonna try checking the cloud paging software just to see if it shows that it's loading or not. Yeah, you gotta go to apps anywhere. I have to too. That's why I'm waiting for it to load. Oh, it was already there? Oh, you're lucky. <laughs> it's been run on that computer, I guess, prior. Um, mine said it was expired, so it has been too long since I had last run it. Um, it's loading now though, so it should be just a few seconds. Oh, I gotta push. Oh, my phone is in my office. I guess I'm not getting into Canvas right now. All right, never mind. So what we want to do is we want to basically say if I have uh, a base size and a tolerance, and that tolerance has some normal distribution, right? What is the variance of the output? So the one that we're talking about here on the board, I was just saying, hey, this is my tolerance values, right? Um, this is the range of acceptable variation. Therefore, the range of acceptable variation of my output is blank, right? Really, when you're manufacturing things, you don't have a one plus or minus perfectly evenly distributed set of uh, outputs. You have a more of a statistical, like a student's T distribution, right, around some mean error, right? So you're going to have an accuracy and a precision to each of those measurements. And so while you're producing things, if you know what that error range looks like, you can account for that a little bit more accurately. Um, I'm going to just do this in a script. So I'm going to go into a new script. Should we watch or should we code along? You should code along. I mean, if you lose your step, it's not a big deal, but you should try, right? It doesn't hurt to try. I can find that picture too, yeah. I just got to hit the button. It may take a second for it to come up. Apparently my MATLAB is still running because I hit a new script and it hasn't done anything yet. So I hope I don't have two copies of MATLAB trying to start. I do that quite often because it takes so long for it to load. Yep. Oh, no, that's the editor. Okay, we're good. I have two editors though. I don't need two editors. All right. So 
we'll say part one. I'm going to say x1 equals to, uh, I'm going to say 1.0. This is going to be the base size of the part. I'll say my A1, I'm going to set that to 0 0.01. I'm going to say this is the accuracy. And I'm going to say positive is bigger. Basically, that is the error of the production, right? And then I'm going to have a S1. I'm going to say that is 0 0.01 or 0 0.1. I'm going to say this is the variance, or really the standard deviation. Of the part. So three parameters that will allow me to define a normalized distribution of part sizes, given this configuration. And you can do this for every single dimension inside your part and for every part in your assembly. You can imagine that that would get rather complicated fairly quickly. Um, and there's two general uses that we can use this for. There is a kinematic analysis of an entire assembly. So am I preserving a key constraint across multiple parts? You can also just use it as a fit analysis to say for one specific junction between two parts, are they going to fit together? In which case you're probably just doing two sets of parameters, right? Um, either way, this can be a useful tool. Um, depends on how critical those values are, right? Uh, and it also can be helpful to give you a better idea of uh, what sizes you want to use. Anyone have any questions about those parameters? No? All right, so now what we can do is call a Monte Carlo simulation. You guys are familiar with the Monte Carlo Casino? For the count of Monte Carlo. So the Monte Carlo is a uh, famous casino. And so Monte Carlo simulation is basically whenever you do a brute force simulation of a statistical simulation. Or a and it's mostly done this because people use this to try and figure out how to cheat at gambling, right? So if I have a poker strategy or a blackjack strategy, that I think that I can consistently apply, right, to see if I can make money. I can simulate a hundred thousand games of poker or a hundred thousand games of blackjack and see how often do I win, right? Um, if you do that, you'll find that the house wins, right? I mean, most of the they also know how to do this and they've figured it out. Um, there's very few situations where you can, you know, aside from counting cards, which is probably the only way you can really do it. Um, you can cheat the house in uh, most casinos. So, Blackjack's like your best odds. It's like 49, 45, Yeah, but they cheat too. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you think the house doesn't count cards, sit around in a casino and see when they change their dealers. Yeah. Uh, they change it when the deck starts looking bad for them. And so, they're able to fudge that number to what's more like, you know, 46% okay. uh, instead of the 49. Yeah. Um, and if you count cards too, you can push it back closer to 50, but you have to be really good at doing that to, you know, to get up above where you're making any kind of money. People have done it and people can do it. You're probably a lot better off, you know, just working and making money. Um, I don't think everyone ever got like legitimately rich doing that, right? Like no one has Elon Musk kind of money from cheating, from trying to cheat the house in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, I better probably just suppress these outputs just so I don't have to see them every time I run the simulation. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna run for a bunch of things, right? So four I is equal to one, two, uh, let's say 10,000, right? Which is not that many for the computer. What we're gonna do is we're gonna generate a large number of part sizes by doing, uh, so actually part, I'll call it part I equal to X1, which is the basic size, which is always what it is, plus A1, which is my error. And I'm saying there's a consistent offset in that size, right? Plus, and I want to do a random distribution 
of S1 plus or minus that value. So what I really need is I need a value that's going to randomly go between negative 0.1 as one standard deviation and positive plus one as the other side of standard deviation. So we can use a random, a normalized randomization tool for that, which I think is rand n. Let me show you a quick search. And again, if you didn't have a good idea of what the name for these functions is, the best thing to do is, you know, uh, random number uh, MATLAB normal distribution, right? Normal random numbers. This is rand norm rand generates a random number from the normal distribution with the mean parameter mu and standard deviation parameter sigma, which actually we could use that. Um, the one I was planning on using was this rand n, which generates uh, a matrix of normally distributed random numbers, right? So I can use that or the rand norm. I'm going to use rand n just because I've used that before and so I kind of know what it is. Um, Yeah, if I used the norm rand, I would use my A1 for my mu, yeah. right? And then my S1 for my sigma, okay. which would also work the same. It's just kind of redundant. Um, you do need to be careful about when you're doing this, that some of these things will be inside of a package, like a statistical package or something. So make sure that the function you're planning on using is inside your MATLAB toolbox. And most of the time, if it's not, then you know find the function that is in your MATLAB toolbox and use that. Um, just so you guys see what this is doing, the ran n, the input to this is how many numbers you want as a matrix. So if I do ran n1, I get a normal, a random value like that. And you can see it gives me positive and negative numbers, right? If I give it two, then it gives me a two by two matrix of random numbers, right? If I give it a hundred, it gives me a bunch of those, right? And the, uh, the standard deviation of those random numbers should be one, right? And the mean of those random numbers should be zero if you do a whole bunch of them. Does that make sense? So I'm going to multiply this rand n1 times my s1. So that way, the standard deviation of that output will be 0.1. Does that make sense? Let me do n. So I'm going to run that. I got to save it, I guess. I'm going to save it to the desktop. I'm just going to call it Monte Carlo. Let's call it Monte Carlo Tolerances. In folder. And then after I do this, I'm going to run a histogram of my part vector, which is the sizes of all the parts given that distribution, right? Um, now, I will say right off the bat here, that you don't want to have a tolerance range that is the same as the standard deviation of your part production, because you're going to be throwing out about half of your parts, right? So you probably want a, uh, a standard deviation that is significantly smaller, right? Like a third for kind of that six sigma goal um, of your variation. But you can see here in the histogram, the actual distribution of the part size, right, from this Monte Carlo simulation. And because we ran, you know, 10,000 of them, it's a pretty smooth normally distributed curve. The mean there is going to be at 1.01, .01, and the standard deviation is going to be about 0.1. And again, if you guys don't have a real strong background in statistics, you should be able to see that those parameters are reasonably well reflected inside that, right? Um, this runs real fast. Right? And I don't even really need to run that many numbers. So what I can do here is I can show you what happens if I make my accuracy really bad and my standard deviation really good. And I run this again. You can see here now that my range on the bottom is quite tight. Right? And if you want to, you can even do something like this where I can hold on. And then I can change these parameters. So let's try making it 1.2. I'll make this negative 0.1 and I'll make this uh, 0.1 Run that again. Oh, I 
so I didn't hold on before I ran it. I'm gonna change those back and I'll run it again. So those, those two distributions plotted against each other, right? And you can continue to run different distributions to figure out, okay, well, how does the accuracy, right? And the standard deviation affect the range of part sizes that I want. And you have that uh, actual value for the parts inside that array. So I'm gonna go back to my original set of parameters, the uh, 0.01 and the 0.1, and I'll run that. You can see that's that yellow one that just popped up. If I wanna know how many of them are within tolerance, I can check the tolerance on that stack up. And so all I need to do is I need to look at the number of parts that are outside that range, right? So I'll say um, in tall equal to part that is uh, greater than, let's, let's let's do, let's say out of tolerance. Probably makes more sense to look at the ones that are out of tolerance. Out tall, the parts that are less than 0 0.9, right? Which is the bottom end of my tolerance. Let me say, and and the last time I used the and function, it didn't work. And I had to change it to the, the other and function greater than 1.1. Uh, I'm just gonna try to rerunning that whole thing. I just ran it. Um, yeah, some of my and functions. So if I'm, I'm going to do this as and, as opposed to using the ampersand sign, and those are supposed to be the same function, but they may have changed how that works. And so I'm just changing that. I'm going to close that figure just because it's stacking up every single time I run it. And so this out tolerance is going to give me a, um, a one for every situation where the part is outside the range of tolerance and a zero for all the ones that in. So if I want another percent that fit, right? I can say percent fit and say equal to the sum of all of my out of tolerance values divided by the number of ones I ran, which is 10,000, which if you wanted to parameterize that you could as well. And I'll leave that uncommented. So it, percent, it goes out to the workspace. Right, uh, I got zero. Something is not right. Uh, do I not have any that are less than 0.9? I got, definitely have some that are less than 0.9. And I definitely have some that are, oh, I should be using or instead of and. <laughs> I should be using or, right? Because it has to be less than 0.9 or greater than 0.1, not both. And I confused myself because I was going to start off doing the ones that were actual fits and I wanted the ones that are rejected. So I, I changed my logic halfway through. This is why you probably want to put in comments, right? So let's just say uh, plot the histogram. Determine the parts out of tolerance, stuff like that. I'm gonna run that again. So with this one, I have 32% uh, of my parts are outside of spec, right? And a small percentage of that is the fact that I have that, that accuracy error. The real reason is that I uh, have a really big standard deviation, right? So if I really want that tolerance to be plus or minus 0.1, probably I should be using something like, you know, a machining tool that's going to give me an accuracy of maybe 0 0.2 or something like that. And again, two hundredths of an inch is a super easy variance to get down to, right? Like I could get to two thousandths pretty easily, right? Which makes them all fit. But a plus or minus 0.1 inch tolerance range is super huge, right? Like if you make a part and the difference between a 0.9 inch part and a 1.1 inch part is big, right? The difference between a 0.99 inch part 
and a 1.01 inch part is actually still pretty big, but it's not noticeable, right? Like you won't be able to see that part and say, hey, that part is out of spec. You're gonna have to measure with calipers, right? Um, this is a hundredth of an inch is small enough that it's not visually distinct. Uh, and a hundredth of an inch precision is still super easy to hit with even rough passes on a machining tool. So if you're on a CNC, uh, even without doing finishing operations, you're gonna hit a hundredth of an inch. With finishing operations, you'll hit a thou. If you wanna get like a fraction of a thou, right? A fraction of a thousandth of an inch, you're gonna need specialized tool, right? And the cost of rough finishing versus finish, like a finishing pass is pretty nominal or pretty minimal um, because again, it's just one additional set of operations inside the code like we looked at last time. Um, whereas moving it to another machine, probably in a tightly controlled environment is gonna cost you an order of magnitude more, right? So if you can avoid that transition from the kind of thousands of an inch domain to the tenth of a thousandth of an inch domain, or kind of like that uh, thousandth of a millimeter kind of the, on the micrometer scale, right? Um, not necessarily a micrometer, but something that you might measure in micrometers, right? Uh, so 100 micrometers, 200 micrometers, something like that. Um, then you probably are going to want to avoid those kinds of things, right? Uh, questions on that? Make sense? Okay. So if you want to run this for multiple parts, actually super easy. All you do is you just define your part two. I'm just going to change all of these to twos, right? Do the same thing for my part, make it part one, copy, paste, part two, using my X2, my A2, my S2, and then I can say my assembly, I is equal to my part one I plus my part two I. Again, whenever you're using the indices, these eyes in MATLAB, you want to make sure that you either always use it or you never use it, right? So if I'm saying that part one is equal to parentheses I, or part one parentheses I equal to something, whenever I want to refer to part one inside that loop, you need to make sure you're using that parentheses I, that index. Otherwise, it's going to use the entire array as opposed to just the current value. Um, the other way of doing that is if you don't want to save part one, part two, and you only can care about the assembly, I could take that parentheses I off the part one, off the part two, and just calculate the value for the assembly, right? Does that make sense? I'm gonna make these a little bit different just so we can see uh, the ranges here. So I'll make this 1.5. And I don't wanna use this 0 0.02 just cause it's super, super tight. Uh, let's do something a little more, let's say 0 0.01 and 0 0.01 which might be a tolerance you actually want to use. But let's make our A2 negative. So hopefully what you guys can see inside this is that I have a positive accuracy error on one part and a negative accuracy error on the other part. Those are going to cancel out, right? And that's typically not the same kind of thing you can do here, but sometimes you can account for that in your manufacturing process. If I know that my 3D printer is always going to print it out with a, an average accuracy error of say 0.2 millimeters, like we talked about last time, or I don't know, not, maybe not last time, but a couple of times ago, that it tends to overprint those parts a little bit because of the variance on the width of the actual uh, output from the nozzle. You can account for that inside this kind of simulation to see if your parts are actually going to fit properly or not, right? And then we'll do, uh, let's just do a couple of figures here. So I'm going to do a figure one for part one. I'm going to copy this whole thing. Figure two for part two. And I'll do figure three for my assembly. Again, I'm copying and pasting just because if I spell it wrong, it's fine as long as I use the same wrong spelling all the time, right? And then I'll say here that for my part fit, I'm going to change this to, it needs to be 0.1 
and 2.1 because my size also let's do let's do um let's do 2.4 because i did 1.5 for that one 2.4 to 2.6 as my range that's going to be for the assembly yeah so we'll take that for the assembly we'll change this from part to assembly and if you wanted to do analysis of each of the parts and the assembly to see how many of them are inside spec versus how many of the assembly are inside spec, you can do that too. We don't need to have all those things all the time. So there's my figure one, my figure two, my figure three. This one has the other ones on it still, so can you ignore those background ones? Um, and you can see here that even though my error on my individual parts was reasonably large, it doesn't linearly add to the error of my overall assembly, right? So a lot of the things that you'll see in a tolerance analysis in a lot of the different software that they have for this kind of a nest, for this kind of piece that they have is called an RSS or a root sum of squared error of all the different pieces. And that's a way of approximating what you would get if you were to have a certain number of the parts, because sometimes you're gonna have a part that was too big on one end, but it was too small on the other end. And so when you put them together, they balance themselves out a little bit, right? And so, you know, half the time the parts are gonna get closer because of the accumulation of error. And half the time they're gonna get further apart because of the accumulation of error. Only in the extremes is it gonna be really, really bad, right? Um, so you can see on here, if we're going from 0.46 to 0.52. This one's going from 0.46 to 0.54, right? Not that big of a difference in the total distribution that we have here even though we're doing a sum of these two, right? So not as bad as the linear stack up that we talked about at the start of class. Does that make sense? And that's probably the main reason why you might wanna to go to a, a software or a simulation based analysis of the stack up as opposed to um, a linear one here, just using like a kind of back of the napkin kind of calculation is that you may find that your distribution of error is really not that bad, right? And you don't need to make changes to get tighter tolerances in your design after all, right? Um, this is always gonna be the, the board stuff is always gonna be the worst case scenario. It's always a good place to start from, right? Uh, the other thing you do here is I can vary these parameters to check and see how does changing, you know, a variance or a size in one part affect the overall distribution in my final assembly. And I can put math, like my sines, my cosines, whatever, into this simulation as well. That makes sense? All right. Next thing I'd like to do is just to go into SOLIDWORKS and take a look at doing this. You don't have a lot of time. Uh, let's just try and do it for uh, the simplest possible part. We'll make two cubes, we'll put them together. We'll use the tall analysts to try and evaluate them. Um, and that's what I wanna have you guys submit for your assignment for today. Uh, where's my apps anywhere? There we go. So I'm gonna run SOLIDWORKS. I'll make one cube and then I'll stack them because that's a little bit faster even than trying to do two. Uh, and then we'll just do the tall analysis and show you guys how it does the linear accumulation of the error associated with that. And you can stack five or six or seven of them. Uh, we may save this for next time. The other way you can do the worst case analysis in SOLIDWORKS is you can actually use your design tables to make a maximum material condition and a minimum material condition of the interface of the two parts. And then use that to check and see if you maintain the clearance or interference range that you want, which is a little bit more work. And I really wish that SOLIDWORKS had a tool that did a random sampling of values in your tolerance range and then check for interferences. Um, but it doesn't do, do that. It only does linear stack ups along a specified direction, right? So it won't run uh, interference checks as part of the tall analyst tool, which I think is kind of junky, but whatever. <laughs> this kind of work be what a design engineer would do or a manufacturing? Most of the time you have manufacturing engineering do this. Yeah. I mean, this is really what manufacturing engineering is all about is how do I design my manufacturing pipeline 
to the point where I'm achieving the tolerance specified by the designer. But as a design engineer, if you understand what the manufacturing constraints are, right, and how your decisions in the design specs affect the cost of manufacturing, I mean, the whole idea of design for manufacturing, right, you can save boatloads of money, right, because the vast majority of the cost for the production of your parts is going to be in manufacturing, right? Um, and most of that is probably not material cost. It's probably time on tools and labor, right? That time on tools and labor is a function of how precise does that need to be? If I can do a rough cut and have it be done, I can make twice as many if I have to do finishing passes, right? If I have to take it to an extra assembly plant and use it even more expensive to do that ultra fine precision, I'm going to really bottleneck how many parts I can make, right? Um, which is a problem. I have a cube on here. Let's make a new one because I don't know if you guys have a cube on yours. So I'm just going to do a new part. You guys don't have class today, do you? No. I'm just worried, like, you know, ah, we've got five minutes and you guys got to be in your other class. We can go a little. You guys okay going like until like 9 35? Okay. Um, if SolidWorks was faster, then we would be done by now. <laughs> So I'm gonna go in the front plane. I'm just gonna do a center point cube that's 10 by 10 or one by one. I'm in inches, so I'll do one by one. And we did all of our previous example in inches. So I don't know why I'm changing to millimeters now. I'm gonna sketch, I'm gonna do a center point rectangle. I'm gonna make it one inch by one inch. So one inch tall, one inch wide. Let me go into my features. I'm going to extrude it. I'm going to use a mid plane extrude just because it's good to have that as a practice. I'm going to make it one inch wide. It doesn't really matter if it's a mid plane or not. It also doesn't matter what size it actually is. It's just an example. Um, and then I'm going to go over to this uh, DIM expert manager, which is also in this MDV dimensions tab. And this, I guess, is not included in all of the different versions of the student design kit. Um, it wasn't in Fernando's online, although I think it should be in the 2022 or 21-22 version. Um, not 100% on that, but I think it is. And then I'm going to use my auto dimensioning scheme to define all of the features on here. Um, I'm going to use geometric. It's not going to make any difference based off this because it's just a cube. There's really not any features in here that need the geometric tolerance type. But that geometric will use GD and T standards as opposed to uh, a linear dimensioning scheme, which is generally preferable. I'm going to take a primary, secondary, and tritary datum. If possible, when you're making a turn or a prismatic part, you want those to be orthogonal. If you're using a turn part, you want to have uh, two orthogonal planes and a central axis, right? So a turn part is things you're making on like the lathe where they have that prisma or that uh, axial symmetry. And so you want that axis to be one of the reference points. I'm gonna use all of these checks, but you can turn these features on and off. I wanna make a quick note that those are the features that the tall analyst tool can use. If it's not one of those features, it's not gonna work. Um, and what it means by these is not necessarily what you think it means. Um, the tall analyst tool really works a lot like the feature recognition that we did for the CAM software. It generates features based off of the geometry of the part. It doesn't actually use the, uh, the SOLIDWORKS design intent tree inside here, um, which Again, if we had a more complex part, we could probably see a little bit better. So maybe we'll do this again in a future lecture, but I'm just gonna click okay to run that. And you can see I have my A, B and C datums defined there. They have a certain amount of perpendicularity defined. That's what that symbol there means. And then that is the tolerance of the perpendicularity. Um, I think that's probably in degrees. This one here has a flatness. Um, I'm in inches now. So that flatness is probably just in terms of uh, inches. That's what this kind of plain symbol represents. It. So it's saying that that has to be flat, any deviation uh, plus or minus two uh, thousandths of an inch would be outside the tolerance range. Then I have my inches, right? They're all one inch plus or minus 0 0.01 inch because that's the standard that I have set for this document. If you want to use different standards, you can go into the options, go into dimensions, 
uh, go into dim expert and you can change the size uh, and location dimensions as standards to whatever you want them to be right. Um, it looks like my standard is actually 0 0.05, but my display options is only showing me two units of uh, precision. So I'm just going to change this to three. So I'm going to go into uh, options. And then I'm going to go into document properties and then dimensions. And really, I want my dimensions to display to a precision of uh, three digits. And I actually want that for both my primary and my tolerance. So there's a primary dimension precision and a tolerance dimension precision. And the reason I'm doing that is mostly because my current size dimensions and my dim expert are set to 0 0.005, but they're displaying as 0 0.01 because my display dimensions are not the same as my actual defaults. Um, I don't know why Really, they should set the uh, tolerances here to block off of whatever decimal precision you have. Um, and they may be doing that uh, because if you specify that you have two decimals, right? So I'm saying something is 1.00 inches. That means it's really plus or minus 0 0.005 inches, right? So it's anything that would round to that value. Um, I'm going to click OK. Uh, I didn't update my dimensions. I may have to, I'm going to try and delete those because I think that it sets the dimensions themselves um, after I do that. So I'm going to do Control A, I just highlight all these. I want to delete all these features. Yes. All right, so I deleted the part, not from this part here, but from my uh, analysis, I'm just going to rerun it and it should regenerate it. Um, that's one of the things that's kind of annoying about the settings inside this kit is that they're all from now on, is what they call it. So if I change my tolerances, it won't change the ones I've already put on, it only changes the ones that I add after that which if you know that's how it's behaving, it's kind of fine. Um, but if you don't know that, then it's kind of a pain in the butt, right? So I didn't change my standards, but I did change the display precision. And then I did that, it updated it after I remade it. Um, you can change these by themselves too. So this is the option for this one. Again, this is not inherited or linked to the overall document options, it's independent, right? So if you change it, it's going to be changed for just this one part, not for all the parts, or not for all the dimensions. Did you change your units? Uh, I mean, I, I, one of the options to have three decimals of precision. Now, I didn't change. Did you change the precision for both the primary and the tolerance? I changed it. It wasn't called tolerance. It was called primary and the tool precision. No, this is the tolerance here. Okay, I changed both of these. But I got your side position. Yeah. Uh, I think it's. So to do the log. Yes, it's the log again. No, 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 so if you come apart, they break them apart, um, then you delete. Okay. I delete it all. And then try that. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm still trying to run things. Um, it's uh, we can look at it later. I don't want to spend too much time where you're trying to play that. Yeah, I mean, I don't really care. I just want you guys to know that the options are there. Um, I guess for the sake of the video, um, Patrick did change his uh, dimensions here, but it's still showing uh, two units or two decimals of precision and not three. And I'm not sure why. Sometimes that can be fixed by just restarting SolidWorks. SolidWorks is finicky sometimes. Anyways, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna save this as just a cube. So I'm going to cube. My caps lock is on apparently. And the downloads is fine. I already had a cube in. I'm replacing my cube with new cube, I guess. That's fine. And then make a, an assembly from this. 
So I'm just going to file make assembly from part, which I can't do again because it's waiting for it to load. There you go. I'll click on the check mark to bring in my first cube, insert components, and it's going to drag in. I'll drag in two more cubes. One. I should just copy and paste the second one. Two, three. Yeah. Now I've got three cubes. If you don't want three cubes, you can do two. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. And then I'm just going to make these into a chain. And the primary reason I'm doing this is we're going full circle back to the start of the lecture, right? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. The actual mates here um, aren't really going to matter because the the tall analyst tool is not going to use them. Um, and this is one of the ones where you are going to have to have the add-in to run this. So if you go to add-ins and then click on tall analyst, it doesn't make a new tab. Um, what it does is if we go into our uh, configure, it's not configuration manager, it should be the, the DIM expert, DMB manager. Um, we have a new button. We should have a new button. There we go. No way of seeing it. We don't get a little scroll bar. Is this? Is it tall that's, study? Yeah, it's tall on study. Um, it's this one here. on that tab. Uh, you can also get to it through, I think, insert or tools, tools MDB. Yeah, it's down here. MDB dimensions, tall analyst study. Or you can just search for commands and pull it up. Now, this one always gets me because instead of like every other SOLIDWORKS tool where like you click on the check mark to go to the next part, you gotta use these little tabs right here. So I'm gonna measure from the left side to the right side of my chain of cubes, right? And you can place that dimension. And if you want to, you can do specific points on those faces, but right now I'm just gonna use the total face dimension. Everybody see that? And then rather than clicking on the check mark, I'm gonna click on the little right arrow to go to the next option. And it says, what do you want these parts to be assembled in? I'm just gonna do one, two, three. And then once you've got the components selected, it says like, you know, it kind of goes from being yellow up here to being green, right? It says, okay, your assembly sequence is defined, great. Once you've got that, you can click on the next button, go to the next part. It says, how are these things made together? Uh, my primary mate in this case is gonna be the actual linear mate between those two. Um, and I need to do this for each part. So I'll do my secondary as the bottom and then the tritary as the front. And you can kind of see that it doesn't really matter the mates that I use because as you notice on here, I actually have more options than I had mates because it's giving me all of the different plane alignments that I can use, right? And then I can go to cube three here on this list. I can click between each of these cubes to see if they've been defined appropriately or not. If it's got a little question mark, that means its orientation in the analysis has not been defined. I should also note that this is not actually using the parts it's using the planes defined from the DIM expert tool that we defined when we ran that, right? So again, there's like this chain of features that it's being activated, it's using. Um, and I'm gonna use the same basic alignment that I did here. The primary one's gonna be the interface between the two parts, the secondary is the bottom, and then the tritary is the uh, front. Which one is the front here? I guess the back and the front doesn't really matter which one I use. And you really only have to act, select those until you get the green check marks. I don't know if I need to find all three. I think usually you can just define like two and be okay. I think I one. You define one and it was okay? Yeah. It, probably because the one that it needed was the width. And these parts are so simple that, you know, it doesn't matter how they slide around relative to each other. Um, and so it's probably not going to affect the results by adding those extra two. If my cube two has like nothing, the fixed one, I think the middle one has nothing in it. Like there's no options. To yeah. Like Oh, you did like the two sides, right? Yeah, yeah that's fine. And then I'm going to click on the next because I've got all these defined. And then it's going to run and say, okay, this is the uh, kind of the size ranges you can expect to see for the part. Uh, here we have a minimum of 0.985 uh, and a maximum of 1.35. And again, we, we had a tolerance, right? 
that we specified of 0 0.005. So you can see how that's the linear sum of that 0 0.005, right? So it's 0 0.005 plus 0 0.005 plus 0 0.005, right? More realistically, what we can expect to see if each of these parts is kind of randomly distributed is a range between 0.99 and 0 0.301, right? So even though we have three stack ups, we only want to like double the uh, the tolerance range that we said. It's not even quite, just, just short of doubling it, right? Um, and the nice thing about using a tool like this is it'll show you which things are driving the, out, the analysis. So if you have specific features, right, that are strongly correlated with the output, it'll show you which one of those are critical. So more useful than the actual numbers, I think in this standpoint is I can see which of my parts and which of my features are most responsible for the variance of a specific gap. So imagine this is a much more complex assembly. I put it together, I run the analysis and it says this one feature and the variance associated with it is responsible for 49%, right? Of the variance of that size. I only need to make that one a tight tolerance to achieve the total variance that I want. I don't have to worry about the other parts as much. Does that make sense to everybody? This one, they're all evenly distributed because it's just, they're just cubes, right? So they don't contribute more or less, right? But if you had a more complex analysis, there would be more variance in that. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I don't have any questions from today. We're kind of over, over class time by 10 minutes, so we can stop there. Um, I have one contributor for 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea you're saying is like, well, I have, you got one contributor for 100%? Yeah. You selected the total range as your output, right? I, have, I don't know. You'll want to go back and see. So like when, as soon as it's loaded, I think cube two had a check mark. So then when I went to Q1, I just clicked, you know, one of the things. Q1, three. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I think Q2 is like loaded when we're not in. Yeah, this one. Yeah, we did. Yeah, it's here. You have your primary. Oh, I guess I have two selected. Okay. I think you probably, you think your primary and your secondary are strong, right? Like your primary relation is the bottom mm -hmm. and then your secondary is, wait, you have, you have multiple, you have multiple primary. Yes. <laughs> so you want this one to be your primary. You don't want this one to be your primaries. Um, what would I do? I think this is where I saw like I could, I don't think I can pick a secondary unless I pick one. Yeah, so you want this one to be one, oh, there you go. And then this one can be two, and then this one can be three. Okay. And I hope that this one will be worse. We want to change one though, we want this one to be one though. And then I don't know if I need to do the other ones. I think if I have that one defined, it's a lot. Two. Okay, it's just one. Oh. Um, let's see what it does with that. Yeah, so you basically your primary reference datum was like the bottom of the cube, and that didn't change the size of the overall dimension. And so it's like, ah, oh, great, everything's cool, right? Um, except for the one that was actually changing, you know, the, like one of them was changing sizes and driving the whole thing because the rest of them were just aligned with that part. Um, Did you want a screenshot or? You guys can submit. Uh, the assembly or the apart, just something from the lesson today so that you were kind of following along. Um, I don't really care what it is. You can just submit your cube or just submit your assembly or your cube and your assembly or a screenshot. Screenshot's fine. I mean, you already have the files for that. You don't have to generate the file. But anyway, any questions? No, I think I can. Uh, figure it out where I'm at. All right. I'm going to go ahead and log off. I'm late for faculty senate already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I stopped recording first, I guess. <laughs>